Revelation chapter 2. Are you, give, you guys giving Rose a hard time? You know where bad people go when they die, don't you? Fredericktown. <laughs> Old mines, yeah. Arnton. Revelation chapter 2. There's a town south of here called Ironton. A lot of towns down south of here, Bonterre, old mines, copper mines, because there were mines there. Uh, out at Richwoods, they called it Richwoods because they found a lot of what they used to call tiff. It's barium now, they call it barium. But all around Washington County, you have these tiff digs everywhere. That's where they thought that boy that disappeared, that's where they thought he was. They thought he was in the bottom of one of those tiff, tiff ponds out there. Anyway, the town called Ironton, but nobody in Ironton says Ironton. Arnton. Where are you from? Arnton. So they never did change it different on the sign. It's still Ironton. Uh, Revelation 2, 13 and on. Good to see you all here this morning. This is the church at Pergamos, where Satan's seat is. I've mentioned that. And the fact that here they are, here's a church in the same town that Satan literally dwells in. Um, let me just run through something very quickly. If you turn your Bible to uh, Isaiah 34. Isaiah 34. Yeah. Because Sister Betty asked me a, a question a few weeks ago. You know, did I believe in haunted houses, things like that? And um, the Bible tells us that devils do dwell in human habitations. In Isaiah, let, in Isaiah 34, look at verse 11. And when you read your Bible... God interprets the Bible for you. Whenever you see birds in the Bible, especially flesh-eating birds, cormorant, bittern, owls, ravens, eagles, hawks, things like that, those are on the list in the law of unclean birds. They're unclean because they ate flesh. Other birds eat seeds, and so they're fine. But he says here, the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it, and the owl also, and the raven shall dwell in it. We have four types of birds here. And he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. Confusion's always, a, it shows a lack of the presence of God. Uh, verse 12, they shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there, and all her princes shall be nothing. Thorns shall come up in her palaces. And that's what you would expect. Even of a multi-million dollar home, somebody's castle, it doesn't matter how much money it costs to build it, some guy, and some people have all the money, some rich tech dude bought a house in Malibu for like $13 million on the beach, and just so he wouldn't have any neighbors he wouldn't like, he bought the house next door for $85 million. Wrote a check. Yeah. But it doesn't matter how much the house costs or who used to live there. If nobody lives there anymore, what happens to it? Starts getting invaded by these creatures. And he says, thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortress thereof. And then he says, it shall be in habitation of dragons. Dragons in your Bible always are always devils. Now there was, I believe, at one time, dragons on the earth, these dinosaur creatures, um, because that's the word they use for it. Back, the, the word dinosaur did not come into existence till the mid-1800s. And what it literally means is thunder lizard. Thunder lizard. So the word for lizard back in those days was dragon. Any type of lizard was a dragon. Small dragons, large dragons, you have Komodo dragons, things like that. But we know that the devil and devils 
are serpents and dragons. We know that for a fact in the Bible. So here it says their palaces shall become an habitation of dragons and a court for owls. Owls are very indicative of spiritual entities, devils, all right? Wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island and the satyr. The satyr is a sort of a half-human, half-beast creature. And people say it's a myth, but in the spiritual world, you actually have devils that have that appearance. In Ezekiel chapter 1, the appearance of the four cherubs that held up the throne of God was they all had the body of a man, but they had, one had the face of a lion, one had the face of an eagle, one had the face of an ox, the other had the face of a man. So you have part human, part beast in the same creature. That's what a satyr is. The satyr shall cry to his fellow, the screech owl also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. There shall the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather under her shadow. There shall the vultures. These are all meat eaters. These are all flesh consuming birds. And as such, they would be unclean birds. And that's what Babylon is. In Revelation 18, Babylon is a cage for every unclean bird, it says. So there shall the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather under her shadow. And there shall the vultures also be gathered, every one with her mate. So uh, back to Revelation 2, we have Pergamos and Satan's seed is there. It is where Satan literally dwelled at that time. So he says in verse 13, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Even when it got hard, even when it became difficult, even when Antipas was martyred, he was killed for one thing. He was killed because he believed in Jesus Christ. That sounds like Adolf Hitler stuff, doesn't it? Hitler despised. He hated the Jews, called them subhuman. And so, and he convinced a large majority of the German people that the Jews were not humans, therefore we can exterminate them if we want to. And it was all because of their heritage, their nationality, and all because of their religion. And if you don't think that thing will happen again, think again. Because we already we have already seen if the year 2020 taught us anything. It is number 1, you don't want covid. Amen. Number 2, that people who have power can decide that if they don't like Christians that they can Kick them out if they want to. Google and YouTube and Twitter kicking people off. So they go to Parler. Parler is something like Twitter and Facebook. So Parler now is getting all of these people who want free speech. And what does Amazon do? Lo and behold, all of their websites are housed at Amazon and Amazon kicks them out for no reason. For absolutely no reason at all. Just shuts them down. Okay? So now all of a sudden, there's no parlor. There's no free speech. Okay? But they're back on now, and they're growing. And all the Twitter accounts, including those of people of fame and whatever who are on Twitter, they're leaving Twitter by the thousands and going to places like parlor. But anyway, we've already seen that hatred and animosity toward those who say they believe in God or those who, who say they believe in Jesus Christ, that hatred and animosity is growing in this world right now. Anybody who has a fundamentalist approach to their religion is going to be an outcast, and that would be us. So, the question is, do we have to be faithful until death? Or can we just drop off, 
don't ever think about God anymore. You can totally disbelieve in God and think that you're still going to heaven. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. We started on this last Sunday, and I'm just going to touch on this verse very quickly, and then we'll move forward. We're going to let the Bible answer that question for us. Now, as I said, there are, I have read what some people have said and just shocked at it in disbelief that somebody who said they believe the Bible would actually say that. Their problem is they don't really believe the Bible. They believe a man's doctrine more than they believe the Bible. That's their problem. Because some, I've even heard some say, I believe that if I can believe in Jesus for 15 minutes and pray and then disbelieve the rest of my life, I'm still saved and going to heaven. But is that true? No. The answer is no, it is not true. Some people, one guy said, I believe I could take the mark of the beast and still go to heaven. Is that true? No. It's called tempting God. You're tempting God, which Jesus said, that in itself is a sin. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. What happened at um, the gainsaying of Korah, which is mentioned in the New Testament, but it's a story that goes back to the days of Moses. When Korah and his 250 followers rose up and said, Moses, who do you think you are? Are you the only, you think you're the only one that hears from God? You think you're the only one that can lead these people? And so Moses just kind of, he was meek. And he stood back and he said, I'm not going to decide this one. I'm going to let God decide it. So I'll tell you what. If in the next hour, the ground opens up and swallows up a bunch of people, which we've never seen done before, then I guess we'll know who's on God's side and who ain't. And sure enough, the ground opened up, swallowed Korah and all the 250 people that were with him, swallowed them up. The earth closed in on them. They were buried alive in the earth. Now that's something right there. That's God saying, eh, you shouldn't have done that. Okay? But they were on their way to the prompt. They left Egypt. They hadn't made it to the promised land yet. Neither of you. We've left Egypt. We're not in heaven yet. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, he said, The trial of your faith. And your faith is going to be put on trial. Do you really believe what you say you believe? Or, do you, or are you one of these sunshine Christians? You believe in God when the going's good. And when everything's fine, you believe in Him and you trust Him. But when things turn bad, or temptation arises, or sin enters in, then you decide you don't believe him anymore. Well, I, I didn't get in it for this. And you leave. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Your faith is going to be tried. It is going to be tested. It is going to be Tempered, what does that mean? When you temper something like glass or iron or mortar, it hardens it, changes the molecular structure of whatever it is, and it hardens it. God talked about in Ezekiel, three different places where he spoke of the preachers daubing the wall with untempered mortar. Which, and my son, Matthew, used to work at that lime kiln down in St. Genevieve. He worked down there and he knew the process. They dug that raw lime out of that cave. They said they got a hundred more years worth of lime in that cave down there. They'll be down there a long time. Dig that raw lime out of that cave. And if they were to use it right then, it's no good. They put it through a kiln. And that kiln changes the, the molecular structure of that lime. And then it, that lime becomes very thirsty. When you add water to it, it just sucks it in. Well, adding water to the lime after it's been through the kiln do, causes this chemical reaction that basically turns that lime into cement. 
Now you can take that and add sand or some sort of aggregate to it, like they use for mortar or they use for concrete and so on. Now it's usable. Now it's going to stay there. So if you don't use tempered mortar, your only choice is to use clay. Clay will hold the bricks in place until it rains. And then it's, going to, it's just going to collapse. It's going to turn back into clay. So that's what he's talking about. Your, your, your faith is going to be tried and tested until the appearing of Jesus Christ. And then if anybody is found faithful at that day, they will receive the reward of the inheritance. Whom having not seen, ye love. And whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith. There it is right there. Underline that in your Bible. The end of your faith. Because Paul, was, when he was teaching about charity, you know, the, there's, now abideth these three, faith, hope, and charity. But the greatest of these is charity. Why? Because faith and hope is going to be unnecessary one of these days. When you get to heaven, will you need hope? Will you need faith? No. It'll become sight then. You're in heaven now. You've, you've made it. You've accomplished it. You've achieved it. Okay? So, but until then, you treat your faith like you would a billion dollar lottery ticket. I don't know, did somebody win that one? They had a few weeks ago, they had a lottery that was worth a billion dollars. Obviously not somebody we know. <laughs> but if you found out you had a billion dollar lottery ticket, would you just lay it aside somewhere? Shoot, I'd hire 10 guys right then and there. Guard this. I'd put it in a strong box first. A safe and I'd hire 10 guys right then to stand guard over that safe and then it'd be me and a convoy of vehicles going to a lawyer's office then I would show up at the lottery office I guarantee you I wouldn't just lay that aside somewhere but isn't that what some people do with their faith they set it aside the number one reason why people set their faith aside, generally, is so they can go back into sin. Just, that's, n that's not the only reason, but I'd say it's the number one reason. Or Jesus said in the parable of the seed and the sower, when tribulation ariseth, or persecution for the word's sake. When they start getting mistreated by friends. When family members come to them and say, you're not coming over our house anymore because all you do is talk about God. We don't do that. You don't get, they may not be so bold, but all of a sudden you're not getting invited. You find out they had a get together and you weren't invited there. You can probably guess why you weren't invited. So, the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found. Uh, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. There is a beginning of your faith, which is the day that, I don't know if you were at a church, if you were in your home, you were in your car, you were at work. Um, I had a guy tell me that he was just driving and he was listening to something. I don't know if he's listening to one of mine or not, but he was listening to a sermon. And he said the Holy Ghost got on him so bad, he pulled the truck over and opened the door and got out on his knees. It's an old road. Not too many people went down there, but he bawled like a baby, giving his life over to the Lord. God got him right then and there. So there is a beginning of your faith, there is an end of your faith. And what you want is you want the day that your faith ends to be the same day that God calls you to be with him. Not before. Okay? Look at John chapter 8.
And you'll see this. This is not just a one-timer verse. You'll see this all through the scriptures, the word if. The word if. John chapter 8, verse 30, as he spake these words, many believed on him. Verse 13, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in what? Church? No. In my word. Some people go to church all their life and won't go to heaven. Why? Sin, they never were saved, they never were born again, never were regenerated. Maybe, they didn't, maybe they're not sorry for their sins, I don't know. But being a member of a church doesn't save you. A church can't save you to begin with. There's no scripture anywhere that says the church can save you or the church holds your salvation for you. Nowhere in scripture does it say that. Salvation is in the hands of God and not men. And you want it that way. Because do you trust? If you had that billion dollar lottery ticket, who would you trust to give it to? Brian, who would you trust? Because anybody can then show up and then go to Mexico where they can't get you. Okay? Wouldn't trust anybody with it. And you hire 10 guards, all armed, so that if one tries it, the other nine can shoot him. Right? If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. He, again, he did not say if you keep going to church, if you keep doing good deeds, if you keep paying money in. He didn't say anything like that. He said, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And remember the difference. Being set free is the bird cage being opened up, but the bird's been in there so long. And remember what I told you about our dog? That if you open the gate that goes to the rest of the house, the dogs won't go through it? Caleb did that the other day. He opened the gate and... Lisa's favorite dog, Sophie, who's, I think, a pig with big hair on it. She's a fat one. He opened that gate, and she stood there for 15 minutes, pawing like that, checking to see if there was a gate there. Because she'd never been through it. it. It messed her mind up. Take the dog and put it in the living room, or take the bird and release it out of the cage, that's being made free, and that's what God has done with all of us. He took us out of the cage himself and set us free. Amen? But he said his, his condition was, if you, if you continue in my word. That was the condition. Romans 11, turn there. Romans 11. Now, I won't read all of this, um, but Romans 11 deals with, can Israel, can the Jews come back to the Lord? Okay, the answer is yes. The Jews can, just, just as God has let you come back to him, the Jews can come back to the Lord. And then he gives the example of a tree. The tree is Christ. He's the tree of life. The natural branches, because Christ, when he was born in this world, he wasn't born as an Englishman, a an Hispanic, an African, an Asian. He wasn't born as any of those. He was born as a Jew. So the natural branches are his brothers, the 12 tribes, the Jews. Those are the natural branches. That's, the, that's uh, Isaiah 11. Behold, there shall come a root of Jesse, a branch of the line of David. And so Christ is the tree, and Israel, being the natural branches, were broken off. Why? 
Because they didn't believe, and God long suffered with them for hundreds of years. And finally, God said, I'm done. I'm done. Paul said it too. I'm done. I'll never go preach in another synagogue as long as I live. I'm going to preach to the Gentiles. I'm going to preach to the other people. They'll, they'll believe it, but the Jews won't believe it. So God started pulling branches off the tree, which is what Jesus taught about a tree. My father is the husbandman. Any branch that beareth not fruit, my father takes off and casts it into the fire because it's no good. It's just drawing resources from the rest. And anybody, John used to work at a vineyard, and he knew this. You trim off branches off the vine that are not producing grapes. Why? Because they're stealing resources from the rest of the vine. You cut those off and get rid of them. And you save the ones that are bearing fruit. So he's taking these natural branches off and cast them away. But then he's taking wild branches, which is us. We're the unclean, we're the wi- unclean animals. We're the, we're the wild vine, the wild branches. He took them and grafted it in. I, and we used to, I remember a couple biology lessons in high school that showed basically how to graft a limb into a tree. And it works, as long as it's the same or close to the same species. It works. You just wrap it up. And it'll join together. So he says, and we're the Gentiles grafted in to Jesus Christ. And so he says in verse 18, boast not against the branches. What he's talking about is don't boast about you being a branch and God taking Israel off and casting them aside. But if thou boast... Thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. See, branches come and go. On a tree, branches come and go. Branches break off. Disease happens. They break off. The wind blows them off, snaps them off. The tree can survive because of the root. So the branches don't ever say, well, the root exists because we are keeping it alive. That's a lie. Who knows Charles Stanley? Charles Stanley he used to be on TV. Okay, he's retired now. He's still alive, but he retired. His son Andy Stanley is probably one of the biggest heretics that I personally know of. As far as being raised by a father that seemingly had it right or close to right. I agree, disagree with him on a couple of things, but it's a big deal. Andy Stanley went way nuts. And he said, and I'm going to paraphrase his statement, but I have the statement in my notes. Andy Stanley said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. He said, is that right? No. He said, what we're then saying is that we are Christians because the Bible is right. But what if we find out one day that the Bible is actually wrong? And it doesn't have the truth in it. Are we to then to say that we are without hope and have no salvation or God cannot give us mercy or we can't be Christians because the Bible's wrong and he's... That part is true. So he said, what he said was, we're not Christians because the Bible is true. The Bible is true because we're Christians. He had it backwards. He had the cart pushing the ox. Or the man pushing the rope. Roy, have you ever pushed a rope? Nope. Why not? It don't work. Ropes can't be pushed. They can be pulled. That's the same thing. Andy Stanley's nuts, but he's got big following. So there's a lot of nutty people that follow him. And so, yeah, so he's, that's what he's saying here. Don't boast about being branches on the tree because you're not bearing the root. The root's bearing you. If the root dies, the whole tree's going to die. 
He said, verse 19, Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, and he says it, because of unbelief, they were broken off. The Jews stopped. They, didn't, they just didn't believe in God. They didn't believe his word. They didn't believe the Bible. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith, belief. But he said, but be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, the Jews, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell. On them which fell, severity. But toward thee, goodness, and lo and behold, there's that word if again. What is the condition of God being good to us? If thou continue in his goodness. Mom, I've been here about as long as you have. How many people have we seen come in, hang out, and then leave? And I'm talking not going anywhere to church. One man, very talented man, could sing. Talented, good guy. And he had kind of dropped out of church. His wife and kids were going here. And he kind of dropped out. And I remember going over with the preacher to visit him. He was in the hospital. And he couldn't hide his playboy fast enough when we walked in the hospital room. He was reading it. When we came in. And it wasn't too long after that. He left his wife. Kids. Just left. Just left everything. I had a man call me the other day. uh, Just wanting some counseling. And you don't know him. He lives. I'm not going to say where he lives. But. He said. Pastor. He said. My son-in-law. Walks into his house the other day, tells his wife, he starts packing his backpack, tells his wife, I don't love you anymore, I'm out. And he left. Left his job, left his wife, and he said, he used to lead us in Bible studies. We'd all sit around and read the Bible and talk about it. He talked a good talk. But, I mean, he's left everything. He don't even want to talk about the Bible anymore. He's done. He's done. And I said, woe to that man. Woe to that man. So he says, verse 21, For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them that which fail severity, but toward thee goodness if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Now, I'm not this man's judge. I'm not this man's judge. Can he come back? Yeah. All of us have. All of us walked away from the Lord for a little while. And God, in his goodness, allowed us to come back. Did he not? Absolutely. So that's why the Bible says, judge no man before the time. Don't cast judgment on people because they hit a rough spot in life. Maybe at some point they'll get to where they can't take it anymore and they'll cry out to God. God will heal them. God will bring them back. You just never know. But I've seen people die in that condition. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, they also, Jews, the Israels, uh, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. In other words, if a Jew begins to believe, can he be saved? Yes. A million times yes. That's his tree. 
If they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Remember, it's easier to graft the same species of branch into the tree than it is a slightly different species of tree. That's a wild branch. You might have a tough time getting it to stick. Sometimes it's just too wild. But the natural branches, they were made from that tree. They came from that tree. Of course God can graft them back in. And thank God uh, there's some Jews right now that are born again, saved, believed in Jesus Christ. Why? Because they believe, they trust God's word. They're Jews still, but now they're Jews inwardly because God grafted them back in. But notice the word if here, if thou continue in his goodness. He says it back here, if ye continue in my word. He says here in Colossians 1, I know the bell rang, but be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Be not moved away from the hope. If you continue in faith, verse 23, if you continue in faith, if, if you continue in faith, if thou continue in his goodness, if ye continue in my word. Three witnesses now. If, if, if. If ye continue. And it's going to get hard. It has been hard. Do you still believe? Do you still believe? Father, I've often said this. I've often prayed it. Father, while it's good, and while everything's okay, hold on to me. Because there's coming a day when it won't be so good. It won't be so easy. And I'll have a hard time holding on. And I'm asking you now, on that day, to hold on to me tighter. Because I'll want to feel like giving up. I'll want to feel like letting go. God, would you have mercy on us all? Help us to continue in your word. Continue grounded, settled. Have our minds made up, our hearts made up. This is it. This is all I am. This is all I'm going to be. I'm not ever going back to what I used to be. And I never want to go. So God, on our best day, hold on to us. On our worst day, hold on to us more. Because none of us wants to fall away. And go back to that old, it'll be worse than it ever was. Father, bless your word on these people, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.